veins of the neck. Hi, we meet again. In this video, we will discuss the veins of the neck. That is, the three jugulars, namely internal, external and anterior and the subclavian vein. The internal jugular vein plays a vital role as the principal vein responsible for draining blood from the brain and most of the other tissues in the head and neck. In contrast, the external jugular vein only drains a portion of the extracranial tissues. Before we continue, let us understand the key difference between the veins outside the skull and those inside the skull. The external veins have valves, but the veins of the central nervous system are valveless. Valves ensure that all venous blood flows only in one direction, that is, towards the heart. However, Valveless veins enable a bidirectional blood flow, influenced by local pressure changes. Consequently, infections in these regions can spread and lead to serious complications. Let's now examine the subclavian vein. It represents a continuation of the axillary vein and stretches from the outer border of the first rib to the medial border of the scalenous anterior muscle. At this juncture, it joins the internal jugular vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. The primary function of the subclavian vein is to drain the upper limb. A noteworthy detail about the subclavian vein is its arch-shaped course across the pleura, situated below the arch of the subclavian artery. The scalenous anterior muscle separates these two arches. Moving on to the tributaries of the subclavian vein, these include the external jugular vein, dorsal scapular vein, thoracic duct on the left side, and right lymphatic duct on the right side. Occasionally, the cephalic vein may also join the subclavian vein. Now let's take a moment to consider some clinical applications related to the subclavian vein. For instance, Subclavian vein catheterization can be performed using two approaches, infraclavicular and supraclavicular. In the infraclavicular approach, a needle is inserted just below the lower border of the clavicle at the junction of its medial one-third and lateral two-thirds. The needle is then directed upwards and posteriorly towards the middle of the jugular notch. In the supraclavicular approach, the needle is inserted at the junction of the lateral border of the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the upper border of the clavicle. The needle is then directed downwards and medially towards the mediastinum. Another clinical consideration is subclavian vein thrombosis, which can occur spontaneously or as a complication of an indwelling venous catheter. Clinically, it presents as edema of the upper limb, especially after exercise. Pop quiz Now let us discuss the external jugular vein. But is the external jugular vein a vein of the neck? The external jugular vein originates around the mandibular angle, slightly below or within the parotid gland. It then follows a slanting path down the neck positioned on top of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. As it reaches the clavicle, it passes through the deep cervical fascia and concludes its journey by emptying into the subclavian vein. But here's the thing. It is not a true vein of the neck because the primary purpose of the external jugular vein is to facilitate drainage from the superficial areas of only the head, specifically the scalp and face. Moving on now, let us explore the internal jugular vein, the largest vein in the neck. It originates as the continuation of the sigmoid sinus at the base of the skull, just below the jugular foramen. It descends vertically downwards to end behind the sternal end of the clavicle, where it joins the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein.
The internal jugular vein is primarily responsible for draining blood from the brain and most of the tissues in the head and neck. A significant anatomical difference between the right and left internal jugular veins is that the right one is typically larger due to its drainage of the larger superior sagittal sinus, while the left one drains the smaller inferior sagittal sinus. The internal jugular vein exhibits two dilations along its course. The superior bulb, at its commencement, located within the jugular fossa of the temporal bone and related to the floor of the middle ear, and the inferior bulb, close to its termination, situated in the lesser supraclavicular fossa between the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The inferior bulb is guarded by a pair of valves that prevents backflow. In its course, the internal jugular vein lies on the lateral side of the internal and common carotid arteries, enclosed within the carotid sheath alongside the vagus nerve. Throughout its course, we find the deep cervical lymph nodes close to it. The internal jugular vein's medial relations involve its proximity to the internal carotid artery and the ninth. 10th, 11th and 12th cranial nerves in the upper part as well as the common carotid artery and vagus nerve in the lower part. The tributaries of the internal jugular vein include the inferior petrosal vein, pharyngeal veins, common facial vein, lingual vein, superior thyroid vein, middle thyroid vein and occasionally the occipital vein. Additionally, the right lymphatic duct and thoracic duct usually open into the internal jugular vein or its junction with the subclavian vein. In surgical practice, the internal jugular vein serves as a crucial guide during the removal of deep cervical lymph nodes. The facial vein is of particular importance among the tributaries as it serves as a useful landmark for the removal of the jugulodigastric tonsillar and upper anterior group of deep cervical lymph nodes. In some clinical scenarios, malignant and tuberculous lymph nodes may adhere to the internal jugular vein, necessitating the resection of a portion of the vessel to facilitate their removal. To safely cannulate the internal jugular vein, a needle is inserted at the apex of the lesser supraclavicular fossa, directed backward and upward to avoid puncturing the cervical pleura which could result in pneumothorax. So that concludes our journey exploring the veins of the neck. We hope you had fun learning with us.